Welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Roos, co-publisher of the financial brand and owner and CEO of the Digital Banking Report. I'm so pleased to welcome Megan Kaywood, newly appointed Chief Product Officer at ClearBank to the Banking Transform podcast. Megan provides a unique insider lens, having helped disrupt finance firms of all sizes from the inside out. We'll hear about her professional journey and the difference between fostering innovation in industry stalwarts versus scrappier upstarts. Megan will also share her wisdom around ongoing challenges women face in finance, along with how she achieves work-life balance while raising a family. Finally, Megan will share insider tips as to what she does to set the path for success, such as mentoring and finding mentors. Having built resilience through raising a family and amid professional demands, Megan Kaywood has a unique perspective on the challenges of prioritizing work-life integration and maintaining clarity of purpose during turbulent times. She uses her personal learnings to build better teams, create better customer solutions, and build stronger relationships across the banking ecosystem. So Megan, we have known each other for more than eight years, starting when you were at Starling Bank and never losing touch as you continue to win numerous individual awards and make a dramatic impact across several different organizations. Could you share a little bit about your milestones professionally as well as personally on your path to becoming the chief product officer at ClearBank? Yeah, absolutely. I have truly enjoyed our friendship over the years. And I am so glad that you asked me to do this because I couldn't imagine uh, anyone better to have this podcast with. But yeah, wow. I, uh, I started out my career in fintech and Silicon Valley at Intuit purely because it was recommended by mentors at undergrad as the company to work for if you wanted to become a best in class product manager. So the first milestone was really just getting that job as a product manager out of university. The product manager jobs in San Francisco, I realized, are a bit different from the UK in that they are uh, a bit more senior and you didn't typically have a bit of a larger scope. It's typically something that you wouldn't get straight out of university. I just kind of happened to luck into a particular program and into it. And so I got very lucky with that, I think. Um, then the main focus there at the time is they were undergoing a digital transformation and focusing on mobile and global. So I had the good fortune of working on their UK product with QuickBooks and very quickly developed a niche skill set with new regulation in the UK with real-time information for their payroll product. So that is what enabled me to go to Zero, which was a smaller company at the time relative to Intuit. And they were just really building out their San Francisco office and to come into their even larger leadership role, build out the UK product and lead that from the ground up. And then I was able to be from there promoted to a global role where I was effectively leading multiple uh, regions develop mall, development wall, uh, particularly focusing on the UK. And that kind of set of experiences enabled me to have a few sizable wins under my belt where I had led products from the ground up. They'd launched, they'd had good sex success in the market. I had a number of patents to my name. I'd done a bit of public speaking and that laid the foundation for me to get the exceptional talent visa to move to the UK. So that milestone was huge because my thinking was I absolutely loved working on the UK, the products here, the ecosystem here, uh, the culture around fintech was just very alluring to me. And so I wanted to come build my own company here. And that's when I met Ann Bowden, who just completely sold me on the idea of building a bank instead of building the, the payments platform I had kind of thought I would work on. And so in joining Starling, the best way I can describe it is like being strapped to a rocket ship. It was just incredible. And Anne, as my boss, was just such a pivotal thing for my career. And as part of the advice I give to younger uh, women that I mentor, is a key element in a job that you can look for is just having kind of the highest distance boss in the hierarchy as you can have. Because then as you're excelling, they see it as a positive and they can help to support you and promote you and also mentor you from their stage in their career. It's just so useful in so many ways. And so Anne was definitely that for me. Um, but yeah, it was just great fun building a bank, 
everyone was very skeptical if we could do it, if it would be successful, if customers would like it, if we would be profitable. And just doing all the things was just an amazing ride. And then from there, being headhunted to Barclays just felt very fitting because at Intuit, they had just started the digital transformation journey when I joined. And I got to learn from their leadership who just developed the most brilliant strategy. And I had the good fortune of watching them from an early career perspective and then going to zero and building up and then going to Starling and learning about banking in the UK and kind of taking that all together into Barclays to lead their digital strategy. Uh, and then from there, go into the chief product officer role to really execute on it. And it was uh, you know, a, a mixture of all of those different events of now let me back into ClearBank, which is a scale-up bank, I guess you'd say. It's, it's no longer a startup. Uh, it's not yeah. quite the scale of Barclays, but it's a nice in-between of a pre-IPO, large-scale challenger bank in the UK. So it's a, it's been such an amazing journey, and I'm really excited for this next step. Well, it's funny because when we meet each other, it always seems like you're in a point of transition, either at the beginning of it or it just happened or about to happen. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because your journey has not been, from a resume standpoint, linear. I mean, mm -hmm. you've, you've done the fintech space. You've done the big fintech, if I call mm -hmm. into it a big fintech. Yeah, yeah. You've done the smaller fintech, a startup. Mm -hmm. You've done the bigger legacy. Now you're getting mm -hmm. back to a, a big fintech. Oh, yeah. What are you looking for in those steps? Is mm -hmm. it, it Does it change because of where you are in your life or where these companies are and what role you can play in those? It's, oh. just, it's, it's, yeah. it's not a clear definition as to why you do it. Yeah, But I'm sure there's a rationale behind what interests you at different times. Yeah, actually, there's, um, I'd like to say it was all me, but part of it is I read Mark Andreessen's blog that he compiled into a PDF that you can download for free as like an ebook. But when he gives career advice, he says to be a successful entrepreneur, one thing that helps is if you go into a very large company that you can learn from really best in class people, then go into a, a you know, a smaller startup company, but that's, you know, at a, like kind of a mid-sized scale. And then from there, you can take that kind of combination of experience to then raise around and start your own company. And so originally, I just thought I was on an entrepreneur's path. But what I right. realized is actually for me, oscillating between big to small, big to small works really well. Because you go somewhere big, you learn a lot of skills, you really develop your resume. I think particularly early career, people don't know you and they don't know what you're capable of. And so they use heuristics like who you worked for, what university you went to. And so trying to have a recognizable university, a recognizable company where you're having your achievements just helps to shortcut your next opportunities to ensure that you're getting um, the kind of opportunities that you want throughout your career. And then going somewhere small or to a startup, taking a risk is something you can do after you've been at a big company, you've saved up, you kind of have like your emergency fund, like worst case scenario, this doesn't pan out. You can take a bit more risk. And that, if you're successful at it, then lends to other big opportunities. So going from Starling to then Barclays, Barclays being much more recognizable. When you do things at scale, everyone knows who Barclays is. So it's just you can learn a different set of skills. But now going back into ClearBank, I see that again as a really exciting opportunity to take the combination of things I've learned along the way to go back into somewhere at an earlier stage and drive it from a different angle. But I think that makes a big, small, big, small is actually uh, very useful in, in a number of ways. You know, it's interesting. We could get into it really deep if we talked about the the inside personality traits that are there. Because what mm -hmm. you're basically saying is you continually strive for something that's different, that's yeah. not familiar. Yeah. And then when you learn it, you want to say, okay, I want to deploy it in a different field, a different way. Yeah. You know, nobody – I remember everybody was wondering – what is Megan going to do now that she's leaving Starling? Because, yeah. my gosh, that was a great gig. I mean, yeah. you know, as you said, it was an innovative gig. It was with a great boss. You had mm -hmm. you had major name recognition. In fact, yeah. you still have name recognition associated yeah. with Starling. Yeah. And then at Barclays, you go, Jesus, she can be happy there. But yeah. if you set your own pace with the with the confidence you build, having done it. Mm -hmm. allows you to expand again. And, and the, the back and forth is kind of interesting. But, yeah. you know, again, for for me to do that or to yeah. say, you know, people fear that change so much that they don't take that step. You yeah. you actually seem to strive for that step, oh, for yeah. that for that challenge, for that unknown. And as you said, it just in the last answer, mm -hmm. the lack of fear of being wrong mm -hmm. goes away. I mean, I, I use yeah. it. It's not my saying, but I say, you know, it, it's not going to kill me. 
You know, yeah. if I have to reset, I've, I've had a lot of things where I said, what's the worst that can happen? And it actually did. Yeah. And you go, okay, you know, okay. It wasn't, you know, yeah. in many of these cases we go, would we do it again knowing what we know now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because it helped a lot. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, one thing's different, major difference between you and I, besides, <laughs> you know, the most obvious thing is that you're a woman. Yeah. And being a trailblazer as a woman, rising to a C-suite level, that's challenging. What persistent obstacles do women in financial services still commonly face? And how are these cha- these challenges different between smaller and larger organizations? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head because when I went from Intuit to zero, I really was thinking like at Intuit, I'd been standing on the shoulder of giants. If I failed or hit significant obstacles, there were others in the company who were also experts that I could just defer to. There was kind of like an easy safety net. Whereas at zero for the product I was building, there was no one else. You know, there is me right. and like as the expert on that particular product who understands the requirements and you build a team of engineers who can build anything, but they don't know about RTI and like the, the different tax system and all of the different elements that you would have to like understand as a product person that you don't have the safety net for. It's a key thing though, to be able to build up expertise and then execute it in a single individual way. But I think at any of these companies, the obstacles are consistent in that when you're early career, you really have to prove yourself. You have to work hard. You have to gain the experience. You have a lot to learn. And you also, when you first go into a job, a key bit of advice I had is you want to really try to build trust within the first 90 days, figure out something tactical, strategic, find your unique skill set, and like figure out how to wedge it in to build trust with the team as quickly as you can. So like on one of my teams, um, we were hiring a designer, but we had a bit of a gap and we needed to start doing prototype testing with customers while we were still hiring and building the team concurrently. And because I'd been the editor of my school newspaper prior, I knew how to use Adobe InDesign. So I just took all of our assets generally for the company, customized it and localized it to the UK and did all the designs myself and created this clickable prototype to use in testing. And it just made everything so much easier and faster. And it was just an easy way to drive value very quickly on a team who needed a gap filled. And you can just kind of anoint yourself to do the job. So being a bit of an entrepreneur, if there's a problem and you can solve it, solve it, you know, even if it's not really within the job spec. But then the thing I didn't foresee that happens is so let's say you come in and you're successful at that goal. You build trust, you're successful within the first 90 days, you're doing really well with your team. um, You're getting good recognition from peers. Then what you have, or you're getting good recognition from leaders, is peers tend to get threatened by that and you get a bit of tall poppy syndrome. And there's like a competitive nature that can start to manifest. Um, That's interesting. So that's why one of the key things I really liked when I went to Zero and then when I went to Starling in particular is I kept trying to kind of heighten the distance between me and my boss because you can get kind of promoted up under your boss, right? So your boss typically won't promote you above them. It's kind of harder to move as quickly if you have to kind of go in different directions around the company to get promoted. But if your boss is significantly advanced from you, they see your work, it reflects well on them, they like it, they can promote you up. It's just a faster kind of method to do it. And so that's one way to shortcut competitiveness and tall poppy syndrome from peers. The other obstacles I would, I've found, to be honest, is as a female, I've never felt, um, well, Early in my career, I'd never really felt any gender-specific challenges, to be honest. At Intuit, they were just very supportive of women. At Zero, I don't know, it's just like, if they, if I was ever treated differently, it was completely lost on me. I couldn't see it. It didn't feel like it. Yep. You know, and obviously at Starling, it didn't feel like it. At Barclays, there was a, a bit, only because there's some older male bankers. There's only like a few key examples, really. But like, I remember I went into one meeting and a guy thought I was there to take notes. I'm like, I'm not here to take notes. I'm a peer executive. <laughs> like, oh, God. But uh. for the most part, I've actually had um, more other like women being more antagonistic uh, across the board. Like, I don't know what that pattern's about uh, other than just being my reality. Yeah. But the key way that I overcome these obstacles of just the various challenges that can come up more with how you just kind of navigate and moving and gaining to be honest, is very simple for me and straightforward, which is I just try to ignore it. I just try to like keep focusing, keep aiming, keep working hard, keep doing my thing and very much focus on being clear on my particular goals, really just trying to work hard to figure out how to navigate that. And when you get a setback, which inevitably happens, there's just a mindset of 
grit and resilience that you have to have. And Ben Horowitz has this great book called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. And he weaves in a lot of like rap music. So honestly, I find different ways to just like listen to music that's motivational to be really focused and resilient. If someone is really conniving and undercutting, I have a key methodology of just being kind and ignoring it. And because the industry is so small, I've made it. I don't even know if this strategic gym It's just what I do, but I'm just, I just turn the other cheek and I'm just friendly and I pretend like it didn't happen. And then we're, we're off yeah. working at other companies. If I see them, I'm always relentlessly friendly. I speak positively about them or I don't say anything at all. And that's just like a key method I've had. So I think, yeah, the, the reality is there's just so many challenges that you can have that will come up. And so just finding ways to be gritty and resilient and to keep growing despite setbacks is just like the, the most fundamental thing. There's actually a positive, um, like, I don't know what you'd call it, like soundtrack on SoundCloud called Why We Fall, Motivational Sounds. I'll send it to you. It's a compilation of the most motivational like speeches. I listen to it multiple times a year or month, depending on how it's going. But it has quotes from like Rocky in it. I've never actually seen Rocky, but it's like, uh, you know, quotes like, it doesn't matter how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. And then there's this other quote that's excellent. That's like, um, how does it go? Actually, I wrote it down earlier because I was thinking of it and it's so good. It's in this, um, let me see here. How does it go? Oh, it's also in Rocky. I have not seen Rocky. So for any Rocky fans who listen to this, they'll know it's way better <laughs> than me. But it says, now if you know what you're worth and go out and get what you're worth, but you've got to be willing to take the hits and not point the finger saying you aren't where you want to be because of him or her, anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. And I just love it because I feel like at any point in any career, whether you're a female or whatever your your particular thing is that makes, you know, everyone has their own set of challenges in life. There's going to be so many reasons at any given point why a certain path won't work out, why certain goals won't work, why things will be challenging and difficult. You just have to figure out how to make it work anyway. And, I, and so I really like those quotes for it. Okay. So do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have an older brother. Yeah. So you're a second child. Yeah, I child. am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, and the only reason I ask is you haven't, and this is one of these things I've known about you and I didn't really sense it until I heard you speak with that. You have an inner confidence that is not a pushy confidence. It's not, you don't have to be the smartest person in the room. Mm -hmm. you'd, you'd rather make others smarter because mm -hmm. you'll still absorb the same thing. It's just mm -hmm. with less threat. Yeah. Where where did you first sense that you had this inner confidence? I mean, oh. I, I your education obviously it's nice to have an educational background that includes Stanford because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you're male or female. That kind of speaks for itself in a way. But mm -hmm. did it come before that? Because you seem to have because of that confidence, and it's usually internal or external more than internal. Mm -hmm. Because of that confidence, you don't seem to have to rely on worrying about failure you just go eh, it's gonna happen I, yeah. you know I'm, I'm good i'm good so when yeah. when did that confidence that inner confidence yeah show up in your mind um it was very certainly from my grandmother so my grandmother had a very like the most resilient strong mindset i can't do it justice with a description but i remember when i was younger she was like my best friend we were so close like if there's a thing of like soulmates and someone could be part of your same soul it's definitely like my grandma like we were very close and she was so strong that like i think before i had that own mental soundtrack in my mind of how you're tough how you're resilient how you um kind of process challenges and like respond to it in a positive way i think she was so strong and she was such a supporter and we were so close. I think growing up from a young age, I was just very fortunate to have that. And then going wow. through life events, to be honest, I had like a series of life events where I think things wouldn't necessarily work out the way I wanted them to initially. And then you just stay and you keep pushing and then you figure it out. And then it works out even better than you'd imagined. Like, for example, I'll just give you a very specific example um, and it just reinforces the confidence is why I say that. Cause at first in yeah. life, you know, you don't have the experience. So it's like through experience, you kind of gain it. But when I was applying to undergraduate, the only university I wanted to go to was Pepperdine, my, my, where I got my, uh, bachelor's degree. And so I was thankfully in the university of Oklahoma, where I grew up doing that concurrently with high school. Cause you can start doing university courses in high mm -hmm. school if you test in which is great because I did the summer school at Pepperdine. I had a professor there recommending. I had a good GPA and test scores. I thought I would get in. I only applied 
to Pepperdine and I got waitlisted and I didn't get off the waitlist. And so I was like devastated. And so then my professor, he was like, I highly recommend you reapply. So I did this whole reapplying. I got in. I even ended up um, like meeting someone else there who had ended up putting a, another reference in for me. And I, I got I got accepted. Right. But then I ended up not getting scholarship. And I remember when um, I didn't get scholarship at first, they were like, are you going to accept our offer? Like the director of admission called me personally. I'm like, well, I'm waiting to hear about scholarships. And he's like, well, you're not getting any. And I was like, oh, my God, like. In hindsight, it's quite... I haven't, I haven't figured that one out. Yeah, I thought it was quite cocky in hindsight, but I had scholarship yeah. to OU. I'd done very well academically. I was like, naturally, I will. So anyways, I had called um, the president back who had been one of my referrals who I'd met in the interim. I was like, thank you so much for recommending me. I'm de- going to decline and stay at OU where I have scholarship because financially, it makes more sense. Um because Pepperdine's wonderful, but very, very expensive. And so he's like, well, let me make some calls, see what we can make happen. And I ended up getting scholarship to go. And then after I joined Pepperdine, after that call, I ended up joining the speech and debate team and getting scholarship for that. And I ended up doing the research that led me to Stanford, getting more scholarships for that. And all in all, I ended up by the end of having a full scholarship, like in all these, like this compilation of scholarships I had. So I think that whole narrative for me of like being waitlisted to being accepted to getting a scholarship and then getting more scholarships and turning it into such a success story ended up being so useful and, and like reaffirming that's, that it, it helped. It's a great story because if you hadn't been rejected, you would have never made that call to the president. Yeah. And, you know, you just in your story, you you take steps that are outside the norm, what we'll see norm overall. You don't get fear of change. You keep on going, I'm going to plod through this. But you do it in a very, I mean, again, I've known you for eight years. You seem <laughs> to do it in a very nice way if i don't know how else to you. put it you know yeah. you're not you're not like i'm gonna bust through the wall it's kind of mm-hmm. like i'm gonna find out where the weaknesses in the wall are <laughs> and i'm gonna find the way to get yeah. in which is a yeah. whole different mindset and yeah you know you know it's interesting because you talk about your grandmother being a mentor and it's amazing when you get older how often you refer to those first mentors i had an uncle that was certainly my mentor in in the business mm-hmm. world as my dad was but my uncle mm-hmm. had another level that he'd always Mm-hmm. Look to me and say, you know, add, pick me up, pick up the phone call and go. So, so how you doing, Moose? And he, <laughs> and and it was it, he was so successful. But what I admired about him was, if you saw him on the street, you'd never know how important in the ecosystem of finance he was, mm-hmm. because it doesn't he didn't wear it as a badge. He simply mm-hmm. did it. And, yeah. and it, you learn these things. And again, mm-hmm. so many people, uh, we talked before the podcast about things mm-hmm. you've done on a, on a personal basis that you said, mm-hmm. why don't people pick up hobbies? Why don't people do something different that would, mm-hmm. you know, that nobody has to know you if you failed or succeeded, but yeah. it's outside your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. And that, you know, honestly, I started with a financial brand mm-hmm. out of the mindset that said, and it started with actually building a blog out of the mindset that I was 55 years old. I said, I don't want to ever be viewed as irrelevant. Mm-hmm. I've got to keep on learning. And mm-hmm. and that's a big element of that. If you keep on learning, mm-hmm. you always find a way or you have that mindset. So mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. On a, on a personal level, outside of the professional skills, what inner traits or behaviors or mindsets do you credit the most to your success for navigating in what is a yeah. male dominated industry, but one which you really negated in yeah. some ways the yeah. elephant in the room by just showing up in a different way than people yeah. may expect? Yeah. Well, the first one is actually one of the things that drew me to Stanford, which was Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck. They have this fascinating research that shows that effectively there's neuroplasticity. So Let's say you're bad at something, but that's like a baseline. The idea is that if you exercise your brain like a muscle, you can build skill and you can build capacity where it didn't exist before through effort. And so the idea is if you if you have a fixed mindset and you go into something and you're afraid to fail, failure is not a sign that you're bad at it under growth mindset. It's just that you haven't done it before. So you just have to keep working and improving. And through effort, you can improve and become strong at something you're not. So I think on the one hand, having that, that view of, not being afraid to be bad at something because worst case scenario, even if you're not a natural, you can develop the skill through effort. And then secondarily, um, there's another researcher. I don't know who, where she's from. She has a Ted talk whose name I don't even remember either. Now that I think about it, but it's all about grit. 
But I remember watching it and thinking like that describes so well, I think my entire mentality on everything, which is you just got to be gritty. You just have to keep going. And then I listen to like a million things. So I'll just keep quoting them. But another one is the last lecture by Randy Pausch. It's phenomenal. I think he was at Carnegie Mellon. They had a series called The Last Lecture by the Professors. He ended up being um, given a very short timeline for the, the amount of time he had left to live with a particular type of cancer he had. So he really gave a last lecture and it is so moving. But one of the quotes he has are like, the walls aren't there to keep you out. They're there to keep the other people out. They're like there for reasons to show how much you want something. And so I've always internalized a mixture of like, I can do it growth mindset, stay really gritty with it and just be aware that anything that worth having there's probably going to be a wall or a challenge with it. Also, The Dip by Seth Godin. He writes oh about... God. Oh, God, yeah. Like, oh. Have you read this? Yeah, Seth Godin, yeah. yeah. Oh, yep. he is so good. The book is actually quite small. So if you ever just have half yep. an hour to read a all, motivation all book... His book <laughs> all his books. Yeah, he, he, he deceives you because there's yeah. so much in this very small book that he has. It's yeah. so good. And yeah, he just very eloquently describes... And he, remember, he references into it. And I read it right when I was joining into it. But he's like, if you're trying to achieve something really notable, like the bigger the thing you're trying to achieve, the bigger the dip. So the more challenges you're going to have. So at the beginning, you're going to be excited, but then you're going to start hitting all the challenges that come with achieving this big thing. So let's say you want the next big like QuickBooks in the US. Well, they are so entrenched, the dip is going to be massive. So you're going to have so many challenges to achieve that goal. And so it's just around creating that mindset of like challenges don't mean you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. It just means you have to lean into it and really work hard to achieve it. So I think a mixture of those mindsets in terms of like going into a very male dominated industry, going in somewhere where I'm really young. I think one thing I had going for me is in tech being like young and dressing casually was like very trendy. You know, everyone's wearing their like company branded t-shirts and being very relaxed. So it was even more, I think of a challenge going into a Barclays where I'm trying to really have an impact, but come from that industry, which was quite different. But I think embracing those mindsets continually really helps uh, it kind of no matter the situation. The only thing I can add to your book list is I love Atomic Habits by James Clear oh, because nice. it talks about the yeah. little things you can do every day to get to your bigger goal. So it's a way of breaking down yeah. habits. And and it was interesting because when I heard it for the first time and heard it for the second time, I always put it in context of how could companies do that? How could companies take yeah. these big, huge initiatives and break mm -hmm. them down? And it was at the very beginning of the popularity of the the concept of composable solutions, which mm -hmm. is exactly that. It's kind of like going, you don't have to do a complete back office transformation, but mm -hmm. you got to move forward. You can't yeah. wait because you'll never, you'll never get there. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Yeah. I just started reading it. It's so good. Oh, it's, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Yep. And he's coming out with another book very soon. So I was going to, I was going to actually end the last section and go, have you read green eggs and ham? Because it's <laughs> one of my favorites. <laughs> I, 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 could, I couldn't stand up. I'm going, I'm going to have yeah. to listen to this podcast like four or five times or, or the transcript and go, yeah. okay, so I got to read all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Actually, on Atomic Habits, it's funny because on my gardening leave, one of my hobbies I've also taken up is designing a planner slash journal. And because I'm oh, just yeah. now reading Atomic Habits, he has this whole yep. thing that your yep. goal is only part of the challenge. Like everyone in the Olympics, he says, wants to win a gold medal. It doesn't mean they do. It's how good their yeah. systems and processes are. And he yep. recommends for goal setting, you start with identity. So you have like these narratives you say about yourself, like I'm not a morning person. He's like, change that right. to I'm the type of person who works out every day. And that requires I'm not a me. marathon. I'm not a marathon <laughs> yeah. runner. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like, you have to figure out what those stories are and then write your yeah. identity goals. And then you have outcome goals. And then like that kind of just feeds into the results. But I think you're right. It's very applicable to the corporate world as well, kind of conversely. So there's no shortage of recognition of your accomplishments I, from the Forbes 30 under 30 to being a trailblazing woman recognized in numerous influencer and leadership lists. What still drives you and motivates you after so many achievements? Yeah, I think the the industry that I work in being finance is that you can have so much positive impact on consumers' lives. I think it's really exciting. And I think in this sector in particular, there's still so much opportunity for digital transformation. And that I find really, really exciting and compelling. I think to your point, honestly, after getting Forbes 30 under 30, from an awards point of view, that was kind of like the peak <laughs> in terms of awards. I don't actually, yeah. I mean, Forbes does have other ones like 100 most powerful 
people, I guess, you know, at some point, yeah. and maybe some of those words I think would be nice in terms of accolades. But I think purely in terms of like the thing that I get excited about is how we can continue to transform financial services. And going to ClearBank is really exciting because unlike some of the other places I've gone, they're really focusing on the infrastructure. And it's something that I'm very passionate about, about the back end. Because for a long time in banking, you'll remember this, actually, when we first met, I remember we bumped into each other, I think at an EFMA conference. I remember yep. we had known each other and spoken so much over like the community of Twitter. I was still quite starstruck seeing you like actually in person. But I remember at the time, there were so many people who were innovating on the front end. They had some nice apps, but really the back end innovation was still catching up. It wasn't being really prioritized or understood yet by all the firms across the ecosystem. So it Starling, we're really trying to champion full stack banking. Um, but I'm really excited about ClearBank now because that is their key focus areas on the infrastructure, on the back end, really focusing on uh, how it is that we can transform banking um, from that kind of central position in the industry. So I, I find it really exciting to work on. You know, it's interesting, Megan. Uh, my wife um, was a, it still is a superstar in the retail industry and in mm -hmm. in garments and uh, accessories and all kinds of other things. She started a company that's very familiar to those in the U.S. And, and I always held her a much higher esteem than what she held herself to. But the one thing that kind of gave her a major hiccup in her career, mm -hmm. and I, it, that's not really good to call it that, but was starting a family. Um, not just getting married, but more importantly, uh, having a child. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it throws you off your game because all of a sudden you're getting into something that you're not born with any skills to. Mm -hmm. Everybody gives you suggestions, mm -hmm. which makes you even more uncomfortable about what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you, you got married and started a family during mm -hmm. the midpoint of your highest point of your career in many ways. Um, yeah. how did that change your yeah. work-life balance and what, what were you able to apply from what you did professionally mm -hmm. to what you do as a mom? Yeah, I think it's such a good question because I've read some really fascinating research and data about how there's, I think they call it the marriage penalty or not the marriage, the motherhood penalty. So yeah, it's the marriage penalty. <laughs> <Similar>. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the Maybe they're connected. Maybe they're connected. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh my gosh. But yeah, so basically it's this idea that like you can be going and going and going and building in your career, but when you become a mom, all of a sudden the promotions and the pay rises and everything career wise just slows down. And so that's where you see like kind of women's earnings like stop and men keep going. And so you see this big differentiation in pay, particularly at that point in women's careers. And so for me, I was just very determined going into it that I'm like, I want to be a mom and I want to be like a, like a full on mom. Like I want to be a good mom. I don't want to like half do it and like half career. I want to figure out how to do both, you know, like just go full tilt at both. Yeah. I want to be full professional and full mom. And I wanted to figure out how to nail that so that I could try to set an example to not necessarily be like the Sheryl Sandbergs and the Marissa Mayers who take two weeks of maternity leave and then have a nursery in their office. Yeah, I right. love that for them, but most people can't build a nursery in their corporate office. You know, it's not very feasible. I did get lucky with the pandemic though, because now working from home is a thing. So um, yeah. I think I, I didn't expect that to be quite so useful, but I very much went into it wanting to very much embrace being a mom and being a professional. And I had this moment early when I was in university where, or college, as we say in the US, um, where I had nominated one of my professors for this uh, women, I think it was like, a, it was a woman leadership award, like female of the year or something other, and she won. And so we were at this big banquet dinner and the president was a female president of somewhere called Comerica Bank in the US, if you know it. Oh gosh, yes, in Detroit, yep. Yeah, and she Used to be was, one of my clients, yep. She was fantastic. She was like, you know what? I'm a mom and I'm CEO of a bank and everyone on my team knows that my first priority is my family. If I'm in an Exco meeting and my children call, everyone knows I'm going to prioritize that phone call. I will get up, I will walk out of the meeting and I will take the call because they're my first priority. And I remember she was like, I'm not gray about it. I am black and white. Like I, this is my priority, but I can be really effective as an executive while also prioritizing my family. And that's what I'm going to do. And I remember when I became mom, I'm like, I'm going to try my best to do, I mean, I'm going to be honest, I don't do exactly that. I turn on my phone, my phone like a bit on airplane mode quite a bit in Mexico meetings, but you know, but I try to lean into that idea that you can be a mom and you can be a professional, but my, it's hard advice to follow. I, I think I 
got, I was quite fortunate in how my career like uh, kind of panned out. But if you can push it to get as high as you can, as fast as you can, before you become a mom, it's good because naturally you do slow down because you're not, when you're on maternity leave, the nature of it is you aren't working. So you're not going to be moving as quickly. But well, if it's not already, your time. It's not yeah. your time. You, you, you don't have yeah. nearly the structure you did in the yeah. business world because I, you could be sitting there and you have something you're getting that, and all of a sudden yeah. nature calls, baby yeah. calls, whatever. Yeah. But if you're already at a high level, it's great because you're at a high level before maternity leave. You come back and you're still at a high level. And even if you didn't get promoted, it's fine. You're in the C-suite. It's great. You know what I mean? You just keep going in the C-suite. So you're already like at a place where when you step back in, you step into a place of strength, I found. And for me with being a mother, to be honest, there's there's so many um, like different resources you can tap into in terms of like uh, child care. Like we don't have family close by, so that's not really an option for us. Yeah. Uh, and our daughter was also diagnosed with type one diabetes, but thank the Lord for good, like private oh school. Gosh. So got to utilize that for like yeah. healthcare type stuff. Um, but between being able to work from home more post pandemic, uh, being able to utilize local child care, then you just prioritize being able to spend time to do bath time with kids after school. And then most companies in my industry work flexibly. So if you kind of have to take some time, but you still need to catch up on stuff later, like in the evening, then that works out as well. So you just figure out how to minute, like manage your time really effectively, try to align yourself with companies who support being a parent and also, um, you know, being a professional. I think one of the things I love about ClearBank is when I joined uh, my uh, you know, future boss, Viros, he was telling me, he's like, just so you know, like we really support parents, like males and females in the company are parents. They both, you know, parent, you know, and so we'll occasionally have responsibilities. The kid's sick and they have to go get them. And like, that's very supported. Similarly, even at Barclays, there was a point where Jess Staley was asked in one of our like leadership meetings um, about attracting, retaining talent, like some of the key elements. And one of the things he mentioned was fully supporting people not only in terms of like being their whole selves at work and supporting diversity in every sense, but also like he gave the example of like, if you're a single mom and you have a kid's like football game, you have to go to it like at 2 PM on a Thursday. If there's some random thing like that, that you need, then, you know, we support you and you come back and we know you'll do your work and you'll get things completed on your own time. But life, you know, there's other things than just work in life and we support that. So I think aligning yourself to companies uh, that support it. I will say one thing that also was key probably in hindsight is, um, Early, early on when I was interviewing at Barclays, I proactively told them, like, I wanted to start a family in the near future. I was like, just as a heads up, that's like the timeline. Yeah. Because I'm like, I knew Anne at Starling would support it. So I'm like, my career is rather safe at Starling with this female CEO who supports me, yeah. who won't mind if I have kids. <laughs> but, you know, banks, I don't know, I have the same reputation. And they're like, that's fantastic. That's great. Um, you know, more harmony at home is more harmony at work. We really support it. So I think we're all kind of it's not the traditional advice to kind of go in with that, but yeah. um, I figured I would told them early enough in the process that they could just find someone better qualified if the, they saw it as a negative. And I kind of wanted that because I didn't want to go somewhere that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't support me on that journey, I suppose. Well, it seems to me is there's, there's nothing more insecure than raising a child because there's no real guidebook. Mm -hmm. um, and every child's different. Every interrelationship between parent and child and parent and parent when there's a child and all those elements, mm -hmm. you know, are so different. But there's also, I'm on, I wouldn't say the tail end of my fatherhood, but the reality mm -hmm. is my son's on his own and mm -hmm. the pride and the reward that comes with that. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing in the corporate world that comes mm -hmm. close to that. I mean, today was a great example. He's at our house for a, a couple weeks for the holidays and he got his call, an unexpected call from his boss. They, they, his, mm -hmm. his boss said, you have about 10 minutes to get together with myself and, and your, your boss's boss. And we have, have to have a good discussion with you. Well, mm -hmm. He's very confident that, okay, it's not gonna be bad news. So that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and he got a, a significant raise, but it was what was said mm -hmm. with that about the kind of person they view him as that mm -hmm. as a parent, you go, Oh, that is that is a mic drop moment, mm -hmm. but it's something you're going to see along the way that that you've gone through the, a lot of the insecure moments that you say mm -hmm. you challenge yourself. Geez, am I doing right as mom? Am I is mm -hmm. this right? Should I do this? There is no guidebook. You're going to yeah. you know you have the people that say have the kid sleep with you, have the kid not sleep with oh, you, have yeah. the kid travel, have them oh, not gosh. travel, yeah. go out on dates, do not go out. I mean, you're uh -huh. going to find a counter to every idea you come up with, but it's okay. it's very interesting. So mm -hmm. as we wrap this up. What one piece of advice would you give to young women aspiring mm -hmm. to be leadership roles? But I'm also say young men, because 
I don't see anything yeah. that you did in your path yeah. that you did differently if you were the other gender. It's basically yeah. the same yeah. path would have played out either way. Yeah. My main advice would be, well, gosh, it's hard to sum it up in like a, a short sentence, but effectively step one is to be very clear on what your goal is. Sometimes I mentor people and they have like a vague idea of what they want, but the clearer you can get on like, I want to achieve this. I want this specific like position at this company or this type of company in this industry. Even if you have to refresh your goals on a quarterly basis, set very clear goals, be very clear about what you want to achieve. Also, one of my early mentors in university uh, had me do this exercise of vision boarding with her. And I swear by it, because if you bring it into that level of consciousness very specifically, and you put a visual with it, with what you want to achieve, it just helps you find more opportunities to seek out that experience and to achieve it. So that's step one. The other thing is find really good mentors, just whoever you are working with, or you see in your company that you want to aspire to be like, meet with them, ask them if you can buy them a cup of coffee and be, tell them your specific goals. A lot of times people will be very happy to share advice, even if that there's no more they can give you, but it can be critical and so helpful. And the mentors that I've had have been so useful in that experience. And then my other piece of advice is just to remember that the industry is really small. And so to continue to be kind and to be hardworking to really just stay focused on what you want to do. If you have challenges or setbacks, if you end up in one of those kind of political competitive environments, just don't worry about it. Be aware of it. Just keep moving forward. And, you know, in worst case scenarios, you can still figure it out. But just to stay kind, stay hardworking, keep, you know, keep focused and keep aiming. I'm glad you ended with that because I was going to end this conversation with a, 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 a perspective on you and, and that I've seen over the years. And, and, a couple of weeks ago, we were in an event together, an award ceremony, and you, you were like honey to bears. You, you, <laughs> wherever you are, you draw a crowd around you because people want to be around you. And it's for exactly the same reason you just brought up. Number Thank one, you. you're extraordinarily kind over, okay. over and above everything else. Number one. Number two is you don't put on air. So no matter where you are in the industry, you, you, you're, you got to draw it out of you where you are right now. In fact, I found out about the I found about the clear state bank thing because I I kept this persistent. I said, yeah. "Well, you're not going to stop." So, so what? okay, okay, we, it's not official yet, but this is what I'm going to be doing. And then, more importantly, you're wicked smart, oh, and so you. you're always going to bring something to a conversation as you've done today that is going to expand the world around you and expand what I know is a person who's talking to you. And I just want to say thank you so oh, much you. for for letting me be a friend, for you being my friend, and, mm -hmm. and it just as importantly, for every single conversation I see that I've either had with you mm -hmm. or that others have had with you that I've watched. Mm -hmm. Ali Patterson is a great example. Yeah. It not only is fun, Mm -hmm. but it's extraordinarily enlightening. So oh, you bring you. a lot to the world and you really do set a path that more people should follow because they won't question whether or not you were the, the top woman in this or top woman in that. No, you're a leadership. You, you mm -hmm. know, that Forbes, that Forbes uh, 30 at 30 <laughs> or whatever it was again, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it's not gender related. It, mm -hmm. it has to do with how strong you are as a person. So yes. again, thank oh, you very thank much you. for being on the show. You yeah. you bring a lot, not only to the industry, but to the world. And um, it is a joy to know you. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me, Jim. And equally, I have been such a big fan of yours over the years. So it's such a privilege to be on the show. So thank you again for the invite and having me today. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking and the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. We appreciate the support we have received to make this endeavor a success. If you enjoy what we're doing, please take some time to show some love in the form of a review. Finally, be sure to catch my articles on the financial brand and check out the research that we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Hasledge, Audio engineer, Chris Fafalias, and video producer, Will Pritz. If you've not already done so, remember to subscribe to Banking Transformed on your favorite podcast app and on YouTube for more thought-provoking discussions on the intersection of finance, technology, and leadership. Thanks for joining us today. And until next time, keep innovating and transforming. Mm -hmm.